In comes Ron Paul and says, no, wait a minute. If we had honest money back then, gold and silver, we wouldn't all be suffering. So I want to see people give Ron Paul a fair listen to. Stop listening to what the media and Donald Duck Trump and other people say about Ron Paul. Listen to the man himself. He's the only guy running. I mean, the only one I see who is actually standing for the Constitution the way the Founding Fathers wrote it and intended. I like it, Obama Rama drama. Go to my YouTube clip, Prolonged in t Detention. Obama wants to rewrite the Constitution himself. One man to rewrite our U.S. Constitution, and he wants to give himself the power to kill anybody anytime he wants. And in fact, he's got Congress to okay that, which tells you Congress does not stand for you. Congress is totally owned by the bank gangsters that have already robbed you of trillions. Ron Paul gets it. And that's why they're trying to push Ron Paul from the picture so he can't win. I predict he can win. You just have to make sure in your county, your election clerks use paper ballots hand counted. By the way, Santa Barbara, Mr. Holland here, friend of election, in charge of elections, he don't want to do an interview with me. He wants to keep the vote-stealing machines that we've got. And we know they stole the fluoride vote in 04. Anyway, here's Ron Paul as he appeared in New Hampshire. Take a listen. The man is a great founding father figure. Someone we should be giving a fair chance to on national media. And he's not getting it on national media. And still, he's in a tight two-way race with Mitt Romney. You are the New Hampshire Institute of Politics with financial support from AARP New Hampshire. Present this Commitment 2012 special, Conversation with the Candidate. Tonight, Congressman Ron Paul. Good evening and welcome to Conversation with the Candidate. I'm James Pendle. Our guest this evening is Congressman Ron Paul. For the half hour, we'll be getting to know who the candidate is and where he stands on key issues. At the start tonight, questions will come from me, and after a break, we'll bring in questions from our studio audience in a town hall format. But before we begin with the questions, it's time to get a quick look at the candidate's biography. Ron Paul's first campaign stop after announcing his candidacy was Exeter. I am a candidate for the presidency in the Republican Party primary. Paul was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania on August 20th, 1935. He and his wife Carol now live in Lake Jackson, Texas. They have five children and 18 grandchildren. One of those children is Rand Paul, the junior senator from Kentucky. Paul got a degree in biology from Gettysburg College in Pennsylvania, where he was also on the track and swim teams. He then went on to Duke University School of Medicine. The congressman served as a flight surgeon in the U.S. Air Force in the 1960s, and after his time in the military, he focused his medical career on obstetrics and gynecology. Dr. Paul has delivered more than 4,000 babies. Congressman Ron Paul has represented Texas's 14th district since 1997. He was also elected to serve Texas's 22nd district during the late 1970s and early 1980s. This is Paul's third run for the White House. The first came back in 1988 when he ran as a libertarian. He also ran back in 2008, finishing fifth in the New Hampshire primary. They gained national attention for his fundraising and grassroots support. Well, Dr. Paul, thank you for coming in. Thank you. Nice to be with you. So this is your third time running for president. Why are you running again? To win. <laughs> <laughs> and the country has moved in the direction of the Constitution and limited government out of desperation because the things we've been doing for so many years, and especially since the bailout started and the crisis that we've had in the last couple of years, the people have looked at it and said, our policies are wrong. They were wrong in leading us up to the problems we had, and they're wrong in trying to get us out of it. And people are frightened and concerned, and they're very worried about the economic crisis, and I've been talking about this for 30 years, warning about it and saying, you know, we're in for big trouble, and people are looking for answers. So I think it's very appropriate that uh, they are now looking at free market economics and the, and the Constitution to find our answers. Yeah, you've been described as the godfather of the Tea Party movement. Do you embrace that sort of title? Well, I, 
I don't know if that's negative or positive. <laughs> so I haven't invented it. I don't use it. I don't deny it. If it means that I, uh, I helped start it, yes, yeah, certainly. And it wasn't me personally as much as the supporters in 07, because it was during that campaign that the supporters of the Ron Paul presidential campaign got together and they were going to have a day of celebration of the original Tea Party uh, event, which was uh, the 16th of, uh, of December. So in 07 they did that and they raised like $7 million and broke all kinds of records. So that was really the modern day origination of the Tea Party movement. Today it's much bigger and more amorphous. There's a lot of different people involved and anybody who is concerned and unhappy with what's going on with the federal government uh, can call themselves a Tea Party member. You know, I read that you first really got involved in politics uh, right after the U.S. got off the gold standard. Uh, in plain language, why was that such a big deal? Well, it was a big deal because I had been involved in studying free market economics, which is called Austrian economics, throughout the 60s. And the predictions were made back then that it was unsustainable uh, because the system that was set up, uh, interestingly enough, it was set up uh, an organization meeting at, in Bretton Woods, New Hampshire, and it was called the Bretton Woods Agreement. And it was deeply flawed from the very beginning because it was a pseudo gold standard. The American people weren't on a gold standard. They weren't even allowed to own gold, but the American dollar was backed by gold to foreigners. So there was some restraint on our spending and the printing of money, and that kept things re under reasonable control. By 1971, Richard Nixon said, no more, we're running out of gold, we can't do this, we need tariffs and all this other thing. So it was a big event. It meant to me that there would be no limits on spending and no limits on the printing press machine and just look at what's happened in these last 30, 40 years. Uh, spending has skyrocketed, the size of government has skyrocketed, our exposures around the world have skyrocketed, the inflation of the currency, the depreciation of the money, that has skyrocketed, and it comes because there are no restraints on the creation of money. It's like, when it happened, I said, wow, we're legalizing counterfeit to the politicians. They're supposed to protect the value of our money, and they're legalizing counterfeit, and the world trusted us, and they still do to, to, to a large degree, but less so than they used to, that as long as you print the money, we can spend it, and that has, that has led to this horrendous bubble that has now burst and we're trying to deal with it. Let me ask you about another topic. Uh, really on the minds of a lot of Republicans, particularly this cycle, is immigration. Do you believe that immigration is fundamentally a federal issue, or do states have the right to come in when the federal government doesn't do their job as, as some governors well, might I believe? I think in a guarded way, yes, the states have some responsibilities. Uh, but, but borders and... Uh, and and border guards and uh, visas and, and, and uh, passports, that's, that is a federal matter. But, uh, you know, in some ways, uh, even private landowners should have something, about, something to say about trespassing. Because, you know, if you're in Texas and you own a big ranch and thousands of people are coming over, I mean, uh, the, even the ranch owner isn't allowed to call the police and say, hey, there are hundreds of people on my land and they're trespassing. So there should be some responsibility to the state and they're willing to do it, but they're usually inhibited by the federal government and uh, they're not allowed to do it. What would you describe to be your greatest career accomplishment? Calling attention to something very important, and that is what should the role of government be? And to me, the role of government ought to be the protection of liberty. And it's done through the Constitution, and the Constitution was written to restrain the government and not the American people. And from that basic principle that more people are looking at and understanding comes the free market and sound money and prosperity and peace. And those are the consequences of understanding that, uh, that basic principle. The founders understood it clearly. And uh, I think I've helped to get people's attention and also to emphasize the fact that freedom shouldn't be chopped up into pieces. You shouldn't have personal liberty and economic liberty. It's all one because you have a right to your life, you have a right to your liberty, and you have a right to your property and pursue your happiness and take care of yourself. So I want to put that all back together. And I think I've gotten a lot of people to understand that because when they realize how important that is, you'll realize that the solution to many of our problems can be found in that basic principle. Great. Well, that does it for this segment. Coming up right after the break, we'll bring in our studio audience to this conversation. Stay right with us. We'll be right back.
Welcome back to Conversation with the Candidate, Congressman Ron Paul. It's time to bring in questions from our audience. I'll jump in from time to time if I need to for a follow-up. Follow but for now, let's get right with our first question, Joe from Bedford. Go ahead. Thank you, and good evening, Congressman. Good evening. I was wondering if you could share with us what your thoughts were relative to what the most pressing priorities to solve the federal deficit are. The best way, and as far as I'm concerned, the only way we should solve the problem of the deficit is to cut spending and not raise taxes. I don't believe in that. Taxes are too high. Government is too big. We're doing too many things. And the only way you can really cut spending is for the people to understand what the role of government should be. And the, role, the proper role of government ought to be to protect our freedoms, not to police the world, and not to run an entitlement system. So as long as the people demand that, it's going to be virtually impossible for the politicians to do the right thing. A lot of people now are saying, you guys better balance the budget and do the right thing, but don't mess around with what I'm getting. So my proposal in the order of, of preference there is I think we still can have priorities. Um, for instance, I think it would be much easier for us to look at the spending overseas than to, child, to cut child health care. And therefore, we can have priorities. And not too many people are willing to. Instead of cutting back on our wars around the world, uh, we're adding to them with even, without permission of the Congress. I mean, we're involved in Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Yemen, Libya, Somalia, and, and we're building bases. We're in 130 countries, 900 bases. We are blowing up bridges and infrastructure in a country. Then we go in and you have to pay to rebuild it again. At the same time, our infrastructure is falling apart. I say cut that massively. And then there's a, quite a few other programs I'd cut in this country. A lot of departments I would get rid of too. But there's room to cut without putting on top of the list health care. We're going to now go to... We're going to go to Bill from Nashua. Go ahead. Thank you, Representative Paul. It's a real pleasure to be with Thank you here this evening. Recent headlines indicate that our economy is slowly making progress, with the exception of some recent headlines. Do you see that continuation, or the continuation of that progress, and if so, any obstacles we should be aware of? I'm not as optimistic as some of the statistics. Yes, there are some numbers. They're mostly government numbers. But the people who are unemployed, they're not waiting for a double dip, they're in one big dip. And the, the numbers are fudged. Uh, I've been around and checked these figures, and if the government tells you, yeah, you have a 2% inflation, I don't think a lot of people believe that anymore because go and look at your gasoline prices, your cost of medicine, your cost of food, it's going up much more rapidly. They say unemployment is 8.9, 9.1, like a big difference. If you go back to the old measurement of unemployment, it's probably over 20%. And that's why the people feel badly. So these statistics that seem to be slightly improved, they're improved because you pumped in a lot of money. The taxpayer and the Federal Reserve, by diluting the value of the money, pumped in trillions of dollars. So Wall Street did better, and a couple of businesses did get, got better. And the people who should have gone bankrupt didn't go bankrupt. But the people are poorer for it because all these bad assets that had to be bought up and they had no market for it, instead of liquidating them and get them off the books, they ended up on our books. And it's all done. The Federal Reserve can spend trillions of dollars in secrecy, and we're not even allowed to know about it. I'm doing investigations of that right now in a subcommittee I chair. And a third of the money the Fed printed into the trillions of dollars went to overseas banks. You know, that is, that is what's so bad about it. So I'm, I'm not optimistic about the statistics. I think we're in for big trouble. I think next year there's going to be a horrendous tax placed on the American people in the form of higher prices, which means the, devalue of the devaluation of the currency. But I'm very optimistic that more and more people in this country have awakened and they know what the trouble is and they know we should, you know, bite the bullet and decide on, on a new policy, new monetary policy, new fiscal policy, pay attention to the Constitution. And there's a good reception there. And I know the younger generation, the college people, have been very supportive of what I've been talking about. So I'm very optimistic that so many people have been introduced to the ideas, the ideas that aren't new and they're not mine. They're the ideas that made America great, but we've given up on it. We we don't have the trust and the faith in the free markets that we can take care of ourselves, and we don't need the nanny state, the government, to tell us everything and tell us, and take care of us in the cradle of the grave. So short term, I'm rather pessimistic, especially for next year, 